started. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Patton. I am the co-committee chairperson for our Building Your Economic Legacy Committee. We are so thrilled to have you on for our credit restoration workshop this evening. And without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Alonia for our welcome. And turn out my video. Good evening. On behalf of Beta Omega Chapter, my name is Alonia Norwood and I'm first vice president. Um, Beta Omega Chapter has been providing services to the Kansas City area since 1920 and our goal is to continue to provide those services and continue to serve and help the community. Um, we would like to thank you for joining us for this event. And we ask that whether you are a part of AKA or part of the Kansas City community, we ask that you enjoy and, and take time to participate. We'd also like to thank our guest um, who is going to be sharing information about credit restoration and also special thanks to this committee for all your hard work in putting this together. Again, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alonia, for that welcome. We will now have our target three goals by LaTanya Patton. Good evening, everyone. I am LaTanya Patton. I am the Midwestern Region Cluster B coordinator and a proud member of Beta Omega Chapter. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated had its humble beginnings as the vision of nine college students on the campus of Howard University in 1908. Since then, the sorority has flourished into a globally impactful organization of nearly 300,000 college trained women, bound by the bonds of sisterhood and empowered by a commitment to servant leadership, both domestically and internationally in our scope. Building your economic legacy is target three of our international program activities. It is my pleasure to share with you just the goals of Target 3. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated seeks to emphasize financial planning, asset accumulation and wealth building, including savings and investments, debt management, and improving your credit. This target is broken into four focus areas. One being personal financial planning and excess accumulation, we seek to provide workshops that will be conducted in partnership with local certified planners who will share information on savings, investing, and retirement planning. You know, all one day we all will get to that place. Our chapters will train community residents on how to perform financial assessments to achieve their personal financial goals. Second, credit repair and monitoring. This initiative focuses on ways to repair your credit and improve your credit scores, including how to check for accurate or outdated information on credit reports and how to protect against both identity theft and unauthorized credit history use. Three, entrepreneurship and the black dollar. This initiative highlights and promotes successful African-American owned businesses with an aim towards spawning new entrepreneurship ventures in our community by encouraging intentional support and leveraging the black dollar 365 days. And finally, four, Operation AKA Assist. This initiative focuses on implementing programs to assist those in need in our various communities by directing attention to the plight of homelessness, including homeless children and homeless veterans. Our chapters partner with or adopt several organizations, trans including transitional homes or organizations that need assistance that provide the much needed care for our populations. Thank you for your support of Target 3. Good evening. Thank you, LaTanya, for our Target 3 goals. We will now transition into Test Your Knowledge with Laura Johnson. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to just have a little pre-test over the topic, relax. And I'm having a little bit technical difficulties. 
bear with me. There we go. Five simple questions. Is the poll ready? Yes, I've got the poll. I'm trying to share. It is telling me that my polling session isn't active because I'm logged in from another device. Okay, no problem. Just get a piece of paper, everyone, and you can write down your answers and then you go back and check our answers after the presentation. Question number one, how long does it take, how long does it take bad credit, bad debt, excuse me, to be removed from your credit report? Five years, seven years, 10 years. Write your answer down. Five years, seven years, or 10 years? Question number two, is bad credit removed once the debt is paid off? Yes or no? Just write down yes or no. Number three, what is a good percentage to keep your credit card balances under? Less than 10%. And this is under uh, the maximum allowed for that card. Less than 10%, less than 30%, less than 50%, less than 75%. Those numbers are again, again, are less than 10%, less than 30%, less than 50%, less than 75%. Two more questions. Question number four, can you buy a house with a 650 credit score? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Yeah, write, write, write your answer down, yes or no. We're doing a pretest. This is test your knowledge. And then question number five, last yes, excuse question. Me. Excuse me, can you repeat number four, please? Number four, can you buy a house with a 650 credit score? Yes. yes or no? Just write your answer down. We're testing your knowledge and then we'll go back and have a review after the presentation. Last question, number five. What is the FICA credit score range? Is it from 300 to 850? 500 to 1,000, 100 to 100. Is it 300 to 850, 500 to 1,000, 100 to 50? Let's see how credit savvy. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> First of all, number five, repeat the question and then uh, just repeat what, the question. One time. What is the FICA credit score range? Is okay. it from 300 to 850? Is it from 500 to 1,000? 100 to 500? And if we all have, have all have written down our answers, Madam Host, it's back to you. Thank you. Now keep tight, hang tight with those answers. You don't wanna lose sight of those because we're going to transition now into the introduction of our speaker. And then we will have, following the introduction, our workshop. So um, Ms. Heather will actually come and give her presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Lois Smith, and I've been given the uh, opportunity to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Heather Kreifel. She is the Operations Director and Program Director of Credit for CHES Incorporated. She has been helping families restore their credit and increase their financial capability 
for the underserved communities in Kansas City, Missouri. Chess Incorporated is a HUD approved housing counseling agency located here in Kansas City, Missouri. In 2009, when the mortgage crisis hit, she had been working as a closing manager for a title company, seeing how the market changed and how a lot of people who fit within a certain demographic were taken advantage of. She decided to try to help change the mindset of borrowers, help change their current situation and help raise their credit scores to purchase a home that they can not only afford and have a decent interest rate, but actually thrive by creating good financial habits along the way. She says, working for Chess Incorporated has been the biggest blessing, helping to change people's livelihood, helping them grow has been the best part of her career. I give you Heather Kreipel. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, my name is Heather and um, like she said, I have been working for Chess for several years. We, um, just to give you a little bit more detail about Chess, we are a HUD approved housing counseling agency. So we also, also specialize in helping people stay in their homes with foreclosure prevention, um, modifications to your mortgage. Um, and currently we've taken on some ERAP funding, which is emergency rental assistance so we're helping people stay in their homes as well, keep them from being evicted, possibly keeping the lights on, the, the, the gas on, all of that fun stuff. So if you or any of your family or friends have any um, you know, issues there or need some help there, please put them in touch with us because we can certainly help them kind of just get to square one again. Sometimes we just need that boost just to get to square one. So um, today uh, you guys have asked me to go through some a couple of different topics. And one of those topics is gonna to be student loans um, and kind of just how to, to maneuver the student, student loan um, roller coaster is what I call it. Um, and then we're gonna also talk about Vantage versus FICO scores and then why credit cards are important. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here with you guys. And can everybody see my score or my? Yes. Can everybody see yes. my? Okay. Okay. I'm trying to make it bigger here. Hang on. I'm not sure why it's not letting me get past this. Give me one second here. Sorry. There we go. All righty. So just welcome everybody. I'm glad that you're here tonight. I hope you learned something. And if you guys have questions, um, please go ahead and feel free to stop me. I do have a couple of breaks in this that we're gonna go ahead and stop and kind of, if you guys have any questions, we can go ahead and start kind of talking about those. But first of all, I kind of want to touch on the differences between federal and private loans. Um, you know, federal loans are gonna be your better option for a lot of reasons. And we're gonna kind of talk about those things um, here shortly. Uh, federal loans, those are given by the federal government. They always have a fixed interest rate. Uh, repayments are not required until after graduation. Loans are based on FAFSA and expected family contributions. So that's a big one. Uh, you also do not need a co-signer for this loan. You're eligible for federal benefits like forgiveness and repayment plans. Whereas if we look at the private loan side, we've got, they're given by private institutions such as a lender, bank, or credit union. Uh, they can have a fixed or variable interest rate. Repayments may not be, or may be required while in school or not until after graduation. Loans are based on credit worthiness of the students and their co-signers if applicable. Most private lenders are gonna require a co-signer as well. And you are not eligible for any federal benefits with a private loan. So here's kind of just some reasons why we, we say, you know, the private lending sector is probably not the best for student loans. Um, 
For many years, private student loans have had devastating effects on student borrowers. Many of the private student lenders made huge profits by collaborating for, with predatory not-for-profit schools. The government has failed to hold these lenders accountable while borrowers, particularly low-income borrowers and borrowers of color, remain buried in debt. Most of the time, these loans can be refinanced or modified, but you must have other qualifying attributes. For example, a good credit score, maybe a, a higher income, and, and even a possible co-signer. There are no forgiveness programs right now. Um, I know that there are a few loan programs that are trying to get some uh, variation to these loan programs, but for the most part, when you're talking about a student loan, there's not much leeway. Uh, private loans also do not offer any interest-free forbearance for circumstances such as COVID-19, pandemic, or other life-altering circumstances. One other big difference between private loans and federal loans is private loans is going to start reporting you late the second you hit 30 days late. They're going to report 60 and 90. When you get into federal loans, oh, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so private loans and default. Um, Any time that a person goes, you know, more than usually 90 days, um, a loan will go into default and it will go into either a charge off status or a collection status. Either way, it's very damaging to your credit report. You can drop anywhere from 50 to 150 points once you hit that charge off point. Um, Another reason why, you know, private student loans that are in default, there, there's absolutely no wiggle room for like interest and penalties to be removed and or forgiven or placed on hold. All of these things are contributing factors as to why private student loans are usually not the best route to go. Um, just in general, when we start kind of talking about federal student loans, we've got lots of options when we start talking about this. Um, they're usually the best because your options to have your loans forgiven is there. Um, this is a true statement. Um, an option to have your payments based on income. So we're going to get into some different programs that kind of talk about the different types of payment arrangements we can set up for these student loans um, through the Fed. Um, deferment options. If you become unemployed or you have an economic hardship, these are all good good things that the Student Loan Center actually care about, and they will, they will help you by either A, putting your, your loan on forbearance, or maybe even just in deferment for like six months. Um, there's options for this is what I, I guess what I'm trying to really get across. Um, there are no payments while you're in school. So until you graduate, um, you don't have to pay anything. Um, you can apply for a deferment. Typically, they want you to do a six month deferment first, and then they'll go up to a year outside of your graduation. During the, the recent pandemic that we had, all federally backed student loans were placed on a forbearance, which that meant that there was no interest, there was no penalties, there was no fees accumulating throughout the time that we were shut down, our cities, government, everybody was shut down. There was no fees or penalties accruing. And if you, for some reason, had something on your credit report show you know, even a late pay, that would be something that you'd wanna go ahead and contact us about because that should not have happened during the pandemic. So part of um, the federal student loan program is that once you hit default, so typically, again, once we get into that 90 day to 150 day, you're in a position where once they charge that loan off, excuse me, or they send you to collection, there is really nothing that you can do through the U.S. Department of Education. They actually, excuse me, guys, sorry. They actually send your loan off to a collection agency that's usually a third-party collector. And that third-party collector has one or two options for you. Um, there is what's called a rehab program. Uh, this is when your loans are in default or collection status, you can apply for a one-time nine to 12-month rehab program. I say one time because it's serious, it's one time. If you back out of the program or you don't finish it, we can't get you back into the program again. Generally, the loans that have defaulted or in collection go to those third-party collectors. That is the agreement that they can offer you. They can also offer you a settlement too if, if that's what you need. Or if you have the money to take care of it and you wanna do a settlement, they will offer that as well. The government does not want you to suffer. They created the rehab program to help you reset your loan terms, close out the old, 
uh, trade lines and give you a new trade line to create new history. Once you've completed the rehab program, it is essential to follow back up with that servicer so that your loan can be sent back to the U.S. Department of, of Education. At this time, you will be eligible for a new payment plan and possibly a consolidation so that you are just making one payment monthly. So I want to kind of touch on this and really drive it home. If this is something that you've had to do, um, even with the pandemic kind of in the play too, they put all payments on hold. So if you were into a payment arrangement with them or in a rehab program, all payments were on hold. They couldn't call you. They couldn't bother you for that payment. They couldn't do anything. Um, the problem with it is those payments and those that time frame still continued to accumulate. So if for some reason you would have been at a year within the last like probably three or four months of making those on-time payments and you didn't follow back up with them, there's a really good chance that your loan's sitting out there in limbo. So that would be something that you would want to definitely take a look at because it's important to get back in contact with the U.S. Department of Education so that they can set you up in your new loan program, which we're gonna get into those different types of programs here in a second. Um, so we're gonna first talk about the forgiveness. So federal student loans can be forgiven. There are some certain caveats that go with it. Um, just off the top, you know, the teacher loan forgiveness, if you teach full time for five complete and consecutive academic years in certain elementary or secondary schools or educational service agencies that offers that serve low income families and meet other qualifications, you may be eligible for forgiveness of a combined total up to 17,500 on eligible student loans or federal student loans. So Let's kind of talk about this a little bit because this is this is an important kind of caveat to the forgiveness. Some people have a misconception that if you go into the nonprofit world or if you're a teacher or maybe a if you're a doctor or maybe you are in government, anything that's public service, you can set up a forgiveness plan for it, but you have to have 10 years of qualifying payments first. So 125 payments is what they require for you to, to have paid. Now, the, the, the caveat to this is, is that they have loan programs that are set up to go based off of your income, or maybe if you are a commissioned employee, it'll take like a pay as you earn type of payment. So we'll get into those payments here in a second, but I, I kind of wanted to just really touch on this because the misconception is out there that if you have, you know, at least 10 years of time that you've been you know, you either you've had your, lo your loans and um, if you've had your loans in deferment um, and you haven't been making payments on them, that consecutive time does add up. The thing that you have to remember is that they will want 120 qualifying payments before it can be forgiven. So as we kind of get into the additional programs that they offer, you'll kind of see that we can set those payments up to be pretty low, um, just kind of depending upon your income. Additionally, other than just public service loan forgiveness, there are, pre there are also programs for military services and AmeriCorps as well. So there are four different types of repayment plans available to you to make sure that you're able to afford your payments. There are requirements to this, and we're gonna kind of go back to the rehab that I talked about. If your loan is in a rehab status, or let's just say it's in a collection status or a charge off status, you are not eligible to do these types of payment plans that are set up. What you have to do first is you have to go through the rehab first. You reestablish that you can pay your payments on time. Once you've done that for nine to 12 months, they will go ahead and put you into one of these payment plans. But this again is where you have to call the US Department of Education because they're the ones that are gonna set you up in these programs. So the first one is called an income contingent repayment plan. ICR. This plan is a repayment plan with monthly payments that are the lesser of, number one, what you would pay on a repayment plan with a fixed month of payment over 12 years, adjusted based on your income, or number two, 20% of your discretionary income divided by 12. This plan is only available income-driven repayment. This, is, this plan is the only available income-driven repayment option for parent plus loan borrowers. 
Although PLUS loans made to parents can't be repaid under any of the income-driven repayment plans, including the ICR plan, parent borrowers may consolidate their direct PLUS loans or Fed PLUS loans into a direct consolidation loan and then repay the new consolidation loan under the ICR plan. This cannot happen under any other plan though. So just to kind of recap on this, if you are a parent who has done a parent plus loan, call me because there are options for you. Even though they tell you that there are no options, there, there is an option for you. The only thing that you have to do is consolidate those first and then they'll move you into an ICR plan. Next is an IBR plan or an income-based repayment plan. Um, this is a repayment plan with monthly payments that are generally equal to 15%, 10% if you are a new borrower, 15% um, of your discretionary income divided by 12. This repayment plan is both for FFEL, the Federal Family Education Loan Program, and also direct loans, parent plus loans and consolidation loans, which include at least one parent plus loan are not eligible for this plan. Side note. If this payment is too high, this is a payment plan that is a little flexible. Um, what we've found with this, and most of my clients will qualify for this program because we're able to actually supply a correct budget or a real budget based off of real life circumstances. So instead of just calling them and saying, hey, my, my rent's this, my car payment's this, and my groceries are this, what they'll end up doing is taking your income and then the, they will actually take into consideration all of your other, your other fees or not fees, but your other um, payments that you have to put out of your budget monthly, they'll actually take that into consideration and try to get you into a low payment. So one thing I didn't touch on on the rehab, if you have to go through a rehab, there's, there's payments all the way down to like $5 a month. So they try to make it extremely accessible for you to go ahead and get back into a really good payment plan so that you're not, you don't have defaulted student loans anymore. I want to reiterate on the, the student loan part of it. If you have a loan that's in default, those actually end up in the CAVR system. And the CAVR system is pulled by every lender when you go to try to purchase a home. So you have to realize that even though it may be showing differently on your credit report, which sometimes it does, sometimes it even gets deleted, but it still shows up in the government system. So what we wanna do is we wanna rehab it and then we wanna put you into a payment plan that's accessible and, and easy for you to make. The next one is called a pay as you earn or a pay you plan. This is a repayment plan with monthly payments that are generally equal to 10% of your discretionary income divided by 12. Monthly payment amounts are based on adjusted gross income family size, and total eligible federal student loan balance. So I will say this to you guys, if you have, if you're married and you both have student loans, don't combine them. Um, what that's gonna do is kind of create a little bit of a problem for you down the road, number one, but then number two, they're also gonna take into consideration everybody's income. So we have to be careful with that. Um, if, if, let's just say we work for a nonprofit like I do. Um, I don't want to pay high payments because I want it to be forgiven. So what I want to do is I want to get set up in an IBR plan that keeps my payments extremely low based off of my income and off of my budget so that when I do get it forgiven, I'm not paying out, you know, a large portion of the balance over the 120 payments. So this is just kind of a way to show you that there are ways around having to pay that large balance for your student loans. Um, you know, we can work that out as we go forward. It's just a matter of figuring out kind of where you fit into the spectrum and what type of loan or what type of uh, job you have. And, and, you know, if you're in public service or if, um, you know, even if you are not in public service and you just want a lower payment because you want to make it feasible for you monthly, those payments are, those programs are definitely available to you. The last one is called a revised pay as you earn plan. Um, this is a repayment plan with 10 monthly payments that are generally equal to 10% of your discretionary income. So just like the other one, monthly payment amount is based on adjusted gross income, family size, and total eligible federal student loan balance. Again, your federal plus loans, those are not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to use those for this plan. Um, this is gonna be for direct, plan, direct loans only. 
Do we have any questions about the student loans? And you guys, I can't see you, just FYI, <laughs> because my screen's being shared. So if somebody wants to give me a cue that nobody has any questions, I'll keep going. Um, there are no questions in the chat, so. All righty. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is one of my favorite things to talk about. This is FICO versus Vantage scores. Um, how many of you guys have, let's just say Credit Karma or Privacy Guard or Identity IQ? Credit Karma. Credit Karma. Um, Anybody else? What do you mean by habit? So Credit Karma is gonna be basically just for notifications, you would have it just to show you kind of what's out there. Um, Identity IQ, Privacy Guard, those are going to be monitoring services that actually monitor your credit monthly and give you a credit score monthly. No? Okay. Wouldn't, wouldn't that hurt your credit to have someone monitoring it every month and looking at it every month? Lois, that is a great question. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So the Vantage score, um, oh, okay, let's back up. With Privacy Guard, Credit Karma, um, Identity IQ, your Credit Wise, any of those things that you can get online and you're actually paying a monitoring service for, they're not going to hurt your scores. Um, because it's a Vantage score, it's kind of, it's considered a soft pull. You'll hear me talk about soft pull versus hard pull. Um, Vantage scores are driven by those soft pulls. So you're not going to see a decrease in your score because you've signed up for credit monitoring. The reasons why we use credit monitoring is typically going to be because we've had some issues with our credit and maybe we just want to monitor it and make sure that nothing gets applied to credit that isn't ours. Now, on the flip side, for your FICO, so let's just say you go to a lender and you have them pull your credit, you will see a um, you will see a inquiry, which will then in turn lower your score just a little bit. It's not a lot, but you will see a little bit of a decrease and you'll also see that an inquiry has hit your credit report. So on basically what happens with that is it stays out there for two years. So let's just say that you were trying to apply for a credit card. They're gonna ding you for a um, inquiry and let's say you didn't get approved. So the next time that you try to go ahead and get a credit card, they're gonna look at the same type of credit pull that you already had, which you had a credit card pull they're gonna see that there was no new trade line added. So your chances of actually being um, approved for that secondary card is probably pretty slim. And that's because what they're seeing out there is gonna be something that doesn't look good, which is that you applied for a card and for some reason didn't get a trade line. All that they can do is assume that you didn't get approved for it. So the reason I say that is because when you start kind of looking at things online, you're gonna see a different score than what a lender is gonna see. What you're gonna see online is called a Vantage score. And as you can see, the payment utilization for um, your Vantage score is different than what a FICO is gonna pull. So let's talk about Vantage score just real quick. 32% um, of your Vantage score is gonna be payment history. So how have you paid your bills? Are you paying them on time? 23% um, is gonna be for utilization. So utilization is basically gonna be how you're utilizing those credit cards. So that credit card question that she asked you earlier is gonna kind of come into play here as we talk kind of a little bit further into this, this conversation about credit um, scores and kind of those two scoring models. So 15% is gonna be derived from your balances. 13% um, is the depth of your credit. So how long have you had something? You know, how long have you been paying on that credit? Um, recent credit is gonna be 10%. So they really like, the Vantage score likes it when you apply for credit because it, it shows activity. Um, so it will increase your scores. On the flip side of that, your FICO will actually drop. 7% um, is only gonna be derived for your available credit. So let's flip to FICO and then I'm gonna kind of explain to you why I put these two charts up here for you to see. Payment history is gonna be 35% for a FICO. 15% um, of that is gonna be your length of your credit history. So how long have you had those accounts and how long have you been paying on them? 
30% is your amount owed. So this is going to be big when we start talking about your credit cards and how much of a, of a um, utilization you have on those cards, because the second that you go over 30%, you're automatically going to drop 25 to 30 points. Whereas on the flip side, for Advantage, it's only 23 or 15%. So as you can see, just that one thing, just the credit cards, the differences are going to show when they, when they pull a FICO versus Advantage. You're going to yes. actually prep. What's I'm that? Sorry. I was going to ask about. Go ahead. I was going to okay. ask the question. Okay. I will. I will come right back to you. Okay. Um. So two other things on this. Ten percent of this is going to be for new credit. Ten percent is for types of credit used. So the types of credit used is that you have an installment loan, you have a credit card, maybe two, and then you also have a mortgage. Okay. So those are kind of the three biggest pieces to your pie. Once you have those three things, your score should really go up as long as you're utilizing your credit cards correctly. We use credit cards as kind of your bounce. Like that's going to give you your push that you might need to increase your credit scores. So for instance, if you have a credit card that let's just say you haven't been using for the last six months and you come to me and you say, Heather, I don't know why my scores are where they're at. I'm going to look at the, how you have used that card because 80% I repeat that 80% of your scoring model is going to be made up of how you've used, how long you've had it, and what your, um, what your amount owed is on those credit cards. And we're going to get into that a little bit deeper in a, in a little bit, but it's super important for you to understand that that's kind of your catalyst. That's going to either shoot you up 25 points or it might shoot you down 25 points. Um, so we have to be kind of careful with that. The reason why these two are up here for you guys to kind of see is because what you get online is going to be totally different than what FICO is going to pull. It's generally a 25 to 50 point change. So depending upon what you've done, so if you've, if you've applied for a bunch of credit, um, FICO, or I'm sorry, your Vantage score might look higher than what your, Van your FICO score looks like. If it's the opposite and you haven't applied for a bunch of credit, you're doing your credit cards correctly, you're going to see a high FICO score. So these two things are, this is one of the most confusing things for a lot of people to kind of look at because it, there's just so much misinformation out there and it, and it feels like it's really wrong. However, it's not, it's just they're pulling different pieces of the puzzle to kind of figure out what your scores are. So what was your question, ma'am? Um, I was just wondering, is it true? Um, so I have two things going on. We have some house hunting going on and we have some car hunting going on. Um, is it true that, well, at least what we were told is that when you are looking for a house or a car, that the, the 10, um, I guess 10 inquiries is considered okay because they know you're looking for, we could just stick with the car, that they know you're looking for a car. So it's, it's, it's okay to have, you know, to go to 10 different car, car dealerships if you wanted to. Is that true? So we're actually going to talk about that. Um, okay. All right. Not yeah. my question. Yeah. So, so definitely that's a great question. Thank you for asking that because there is a difference. Um, and what I do tell people when you're going to go pl apply for a car, um, the best thing to do is to come and see me. And, and I don't say that just because of what I do, but I say that because we actually pull a, a FICO, a true FICO, and it's a soft pull. So it's not going to affect your scores because we are a HUD approved housing counseling agency we're able to go ahead and get that pulled for you with no, no detriment to your credit report. And we can actually kind of see what your scores really are so that when you do go to that dealership, you can walk in there and say, hey, I have a 660. So I want you to place me with a lender who can do a 660 credit score. Uh, uh, anytime that you go into these dealerships, they don't care what you have on your credit report other than the fact that you have a car note and you've been making payments for this and have you had any lates? They don't care how many times they destroy your credit by running it 10 to 15 times. Let's say you walk in there with a 550 credit score and you say, I'm not sure what my credit score is. They, they're going to pull you, see if you approve with them. Most likely you won't approve with them. So they'll go ahead and put you onto the next one. They might pull you through Santander. They might pull you through Chrysler Capital. There's going to be several that they might try to pull you through. Each of those will pull their own credit report Every time you're getting dinged, it's not a huge ding, but there is a ding to your report as you go forward. So 
it's super, super important to kind of be careful there and just be cognizant. Knowledge is power. So if you walk in there and you say, hey, I have a 660, I don't want you pulling my credit. I don't want you saying, or I don't want you sending it to 10 different lenders. I want you to send me to someplace that can actually help me. That's gonna eliminate those 15 pulls that you might get at a car dealership. Um, okay, thank that you. that makes sense? It does, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is gonna be kind of just FICO versus uh, Vantage and kind of just breaking down all those little things. This is one of the biggest differences between your FICO and your Vantage. Mm -hmm. um, FICO mm -hmm. requires that at least one account be open for more than six, mm -hmm. more than six months ago. Now, this is gonna be so that they can actually create that history. Remember, history is 35% of your score. So if you don't have an account that's more than six months old, you're kind of missing out on what your scores really should be. Whereas on a Vantage score, it only requires one month of history. So this being one of the biggest parts of the scoring model, you can understand why there's such a huge difference. It's also why when we pull FICO, you might be a 640, but Vantage might have you at a 690. So just to kind of give you some comparison there, it is a huge difference when you start talking about numbers. So here you go, here's your credit inquiries. So if FICO counts multiple inquiries for rate shopping for a mortgage, auto loan, or student loan as one inquiry within a 45 day period. Now, even though there, it might show two, three, four, five, you may see, I, I, and I, this is my disclaimer, you may see anywhere from a three to five point drop. Sometimes it's even more, but just to kind of give you an idea, those are things that you kind of need to watch out for. If you choose to do, um, like if you want to purchase a home, I do recommend that you don't shop around with your credit. I recommend that you shop around and you ask questions. You ask what type of programs they have. You ask what their interest rates are. You ask kind of what their fees are. But don't let them pull your credit, you know, come and talk to a professional first and know what your credit scores are and kind of know what the programs are. That's going to help you navigate and not have to have 10 different pulls on your credit for any of those things. Your Vantage score counts multiple inquiries for utility companies, mortgages or auto loans as one within a 14 day period. So again, 45 to 14, you can see there that your scores are probably going to drop a little bit if you start doing a bunch of inquiries on Vantage. Now remember, Vantage is the one that you can monitor. So every time you're looking at your Vantage score, kind of have it in the back of your mind that it's probably gonna be anywhere from 25 to 50 points off of what FICO would be, either way, whether it's up or down. Late payments. FICO <laughs> weighs late payments from all types equally. This is super important. If you have a car loan that you go late on, it's gonna affect you the same way that it's gonna affect you if you go late on your credit card payment. What does this mean? This means that we pay our bills that are reporting to our credit report, period. If we have to let something go, and this is probably not the best thing to be talking about right now, especially with everybody that's in crisis mode, you know, trying to pay their bills, but it's best to go ahead and put your lights or your gas a little bit aside and make sure that you're still making your car payment you're still making your house payment and or credit cards. The reason I say this is because trying to bounce back from a late might take you two years. Um, a late payment, whether it's 30, 60 or 90 can be anywhere from 50 to 150 points off of your credit report. So let's say that we own a home and we've made payments on that and we cannot make our mortgage payment. So we have a late payment. First of all, your scores are gonna drop about 50 points. Second of all, any lender that's looking at you to maybe do a refinance to get you out of your current situation, or maybe you decided to try to buy another house, they're going to look at that history quickly. So any time that you have a, 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 a and it's typically one payment within the last year that's late, there's going to be a hard time getting you approved for a loan. Um, that's just typically what we see. Uh, your Vantage score is going to place heavier penalties against late mortgage payments, um, than other types of credit. So if you have a mortgage payment on your late, or I'm sorry, if you have a late mortgage payment on your Vantage score, your FICO score might actually be higher. So just kind of something to think about as you, as you navigate further with your credit score and kind of just, even if you don't do it yet, start to monitor your credit and kind of just take a look at what's happening monthly. That'll kind of give you a really good idea as to maybe how 
your credit cards, if they're maxed out, lower your score versus when you have them paid under a certain percentage, which I won't give that away yet, but if they're paid under a certain percentage that your scores are gonna rise. So these are just, these are little tips and, and tricks as we go forward. When you're scoring for credit cards, FICO requires six months of credit history. This will have a significant impact on your credit scores. On a Vantage score, it only requires one month of history and there's a moderate impact on your credit score. So again, you're gonna see a little bit of a difference when we start talking about how things report to your credit report. So why should we have a credit card? <clears throat> the easiest and quickest thing to say is that it's an opportunity to build credit. Um, anytime that your credit is missing a credit card, you are missing out on anywhere from 25 to 50 points just because you don't have a credit card and you're not using it the right way. So my recommendation is always two credit cards. And I'm gonna give you a quick little tip on what to do with your credit cards to really kind of get your scores to move. Let's just say that we have a credit card that has a $500 limit on it. First of all, we don't ever want to go over $50 on that card. The reason is, is because once we start going over that, our ratios start to change. Once we hit 30%, we're gonna automatically drop. So it's important to say, if we're gonna build our credit or we're gonna just really kind of take a couple months to kind of maybe just test it and see what happens, we're gonna do a $25 tank of gas or 30, whatever you guys wanna do. You are going to let that balance ride out for a little bit. And then you're gonna go into your, your app or, or however you pay your bill. And instead of paying 25, you're gonna pay 24 or you're gonna pay 23. Let's just, leave, we'll leave $2 on the card. What this is gonna do is start to create a pattern of how you pay your bills. So next month, we're gonna leave $3 on the card. We're gonna do the exact same process that we did last month and we're gonna leave $3 this time. The key is to leave a different balance each month. What this does, if you really think about this, the credit card companies pay to report information to the bureaus. So if you are using your credit cards all month long and then you pay it off, you pay off the zero balance, you pay it down to zero, there's nothing carrying over. There's really nothing for that credit card company to be forced to report. Now I say forced because by law, they're supposed to do all of that. They're supposed to report it. They're supposed to show good payment history as well as bad payment history. Either way, they're supposed to report it. The problem is, and the reason why I have a job is because they don't always do theirs. They don't always do things correctly. So we literally will tell people the best thing to do is to force them into reporting something. So last month, my balance was $2. So this month, I'm going to leave it at $3. Next month, I'm going to leave it at $4. And then the following month, I'm going to go back to either two or three. Whatever's different from the month before, this is going to start to create a pattern. The second that you start doing that, you're going to see a nice increase in your scores. The other thing to really think about is if you have a credit card, I have a for instance for you. I have a really good friend who's a mortgage broker. Um, we've been friends for about 15 years. She, um, you know, after talking with her for this long and we've been doing credit this long together, um, you'd think that she would have known this, but she had a credit card that she hadn't used for about six months. And I was reviewing her report with her. And I said, you know, I said, you really should use this credit card. I said, you have great history on it, but you haven't, there's been absolutely no activity for six months. I said, so why don't you go ahead and put something small on it? Just, you know, I think it was a Torrid card. I told her to go buy some underwear, you know, just something small. So she did that. She had an increase of 65 points. So I'm telling you that it works. We just have to figure out kind of what works in your budget, you know, start kind of just playing around with those credit cards. If you want some advice on that, I'm more than willing to give it to you. I think that, um, you know, when we start using them and we start seeing the activity, it starts to create that algorithm, which picks up that piece of the pie. It shows that you're actually creating history. You are making your payments on time. You're keeping your utilization low, which on the next pie chart, I'm gonna kind of show you why? Because it's 80% of your score ends up being derived from that credit card. So it's super important to have them. It's super important to use them the right way. Now that always gets questions. Does anybody have any questions about how to use your credit card? Okay. Um, 
I'm sorry, Laura. We have a question in the chat. Okay. There's a question in the chat. chat. Um, Laura, you want to ask the question? I, I can do that. Um, the question in the chat is, and I'm sorry, I was um, trying to read it myself, is how can closing a credit card account affect your score? This is a great question to whoever posted that. So oh, we can't it'll, hear actually, you. it'll actually- We can't drop hear you. you. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, there we go. I can hear you now. Okay. Um, this is a great question. Absolutely great question. Um, if you have a credit card, so, so let's really think through this. 35% of your score is derived by your history. So if you have a credit card that let's just say it's five years old, you've been using it for five years and you just, you know what, Heather, I don't wanna use this card anymore. I just really wanna close it. Automatically, you're gonna drop. You're probably gonna drop anywhere from 30 to 50 points. That's just my guess. Um, the reason is, is because that history is your biggest portion of your pie. So if you get rid of 35%, something that was helping you build your credit, automatically you will drop. Um, and that's another really good lead into a story. We had somebody who was ready to purchase a home. And again, we do all the pre-purchase counseling. So we go through the credit report with them. We help them kind of just start from scratch, rebuilding their credit, um, helping them restore it, helping them settle out debts. We got all the way to the end of the process. And we literally, we were probably 45 days out to close. And uh, they called and they said, so I'm not sure it, how you feel about this, but I went ahead and closed out my credit card. Automatically, I went into panic mode because they had not had their credit pulled yet by the lender. So we wanted to get them to anywhere for a 620 to a 640. I was pulling a 640 at the time, which really concerned me because that was right at where I wanted them to be for an FHA loan. So when it all came down to it, they closed their loan and, or they closed out that card and they dropped 45 points. So not only did it kick them out of the, the program that they were in, um, I believe they were in a first time home buyers program for MHC as well. Um, it kicked them out of that and they had to do a different type of loan um, and a little bit of a higher interest rate and a little bit more money down. So it really does affect you. I would recommend that if you have a credit card and you know, some, some of us just don't like to use credit cards. Some of us like to have them maybe for emergency purposes. If your scores are good and you are at a 660 to a 700 and you don't feel like you need to build your scores, just have them. Have them for that rainy day of when you need them. Use them periodically. That'll just help kind of keep your scores moving in the right direction. Don't close the account. It will hurt your scores. It'll hurt your scores even more if the creditor closes your account as well. So um, usually it's about a year's worth of time that you can let those credit cards sit. So you don't want to let them sit much longer than that. Um, my recommendation, if you don't want to use credit cards, I would just say once every three or four months, I'd pick it up and I'd use it for a tank of gas and I'd pay it right back just to keep activity on the account. All right, so just some more reasons why we could have a credit card. Um, earning and rewards such as cash back or miles points. Um, if you guys are just starting on getting a credit card, Capital One has a pretty good credit builder account and it's also got um, some cash back to it. It's not a whole lot of money. It's just, you just get you know a percentage back um, on a monthly basis that you can use for a cash um, credit to your account, or you can increase your balance. It really, it's not a whole lot, but it's just, it's more of the mindset of when somebody's learning to build their credit, um, what we might do sometimes is have you set up like a utility bill or something on your credit card. You get to choose what type of cash back rewards you want. So like if you choose to use your credit card for groceries, every time you go to the grocery store, you're going to get a little bit of cash back. Same goes with a utility bill or something of that nature. Um, putting a hold on a rental car or, or a hotel room. I learned this the hard way. I was in a city where um, I needed to, to get a rental car and I had taken my debit card with me. I didn't have a credit card at the time. Um, I'm not only, I not only do this for a living but I'm also a full-time client too. Um, I've been through a divorce and I've had other reasons why I've had to be my own client, but 
and that's neither here nor there. But anyway, I took my debit card with me and um, they said I, they couldn't get me a car. They could not rent me a car without a credit card. So I was standing there defeated um, and they said, well, if you can get a um, copy of your utility bill or something of that nature. Well, again, I was traveling, so I didn't have that. So I was kind of stuck. And that really kind of made me kind of think about other people in my position. Um, you absolutely have to have a credit card at some point, you know, whether it's to do a hotel room, a rental car. Um, there's a lot of reasons to have them. Most importantly, just to kind of build the history. Um, having a credit card, there's protection against credit card fraud. So if you're traveling, it's better to use your credit cards than it is to use your debit card, just for the simple fact that, you know, your stuff can be stolen while you're traveling. Um, you never know whose Wi-Fi you're jumping on or anything like that. So just be super careful and cognizant of where you're at and what you're using. Um, free credit score information. This is a different version of FICO. Um, there are several different versions of FICO, but credit cards are going to pull a version of FICO and then they're going to look at like accounts. So all of the credit cards are going to pull kind of the same score and then they're going to look to see if you've gotten other credit cards that you've been approved for. Um, there are no foreign transaction fees, increased purchasing power, and then it's not linked to your checking or savings account. So those are all just big reasons to kind of start to think about getting a credit card. So I added the FICO pie chart one more time just to kind of show you um, 30% of your score is your amount owed, 35% of your score is going to be derived from history, 15% is how you've paid back the debt. This results in about 80% of your score being based on how you use and pay back your credit cards and how long you've had them. So as you can see, this is going to be one of those things that without it, it's going to be really hard to build a score. So with that, that um, ends my, let's see here, sorry guys, I'm, I'm going to try to get back into seeing everybody. Um, that ends my part of the the presentation, but I do want to open it up for questions. Um, I hope that you guys do have some questions. And then we're also going to talk about the, uh, the test questions that we gave you at the beginning of the program as well. Hang on here. I'm sorry, guys, I'm trying to get back to you and I don't know how to get back to you. Um, you may be able to like hover up over share. The top. There we go, stop share. There we go, I found you guys. Sorry about that. I couldn't see any of you through the whole process. So <laughs> it was one of those things where I wasn't even sure if anybody had their hand up. So does anybody have any questions for me? I do, Heather. I think um, throughout your presentation, which is awesome, by the way, and very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, throughout your presentation, I know that you were saying that we could people could use you all as a resource. Um, is there a fee for credit counseling at your organization? How does that part work? So um, typically what I do when I'm asked to do a speaking event, um, I always give out a free credit report. Our credit reports are $25. Um, typically what I will do is give you my information. You guys can all contact me personally and we will do a quick credit report poll um, and that'll be on us. If you need credit restoration or you need further help, so you know we're actually trying to get in and, and help out your credit scores, get them to build, um, there are fees for that. It goes anywhere from 125 to 299 and we're all income based. If you if that's too high for you guys or if someone has an issue with that, um, we do have grant programs that do help us help assist us. So if you know somebody outside of even your group that can't really afford to do this, but they need to either get into a new housing or they need, I mean some people, let's just face it, some people can't even get a rental right now because of their history. So that's another person that I can help. We would just have to do some grant funding for that. So um, our fees are negotiable, I guess, is where I'm going with that. So for all of you that are here today, all you have to do is tell me that you are on this, this live. And then we'll go ahead and do the $25 for you for the credit report. And then anything else after that, um, we would talk about your fees personally. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So you're saying that the credit report is $25 or are you waiving that $25? I'm going to waive that $25 for this group. 
Heather, I'm, and I, I'm getting ready to schedule my appointment uh, after this thing, but I did have a question for you uh, for my brother, and I, I would like to refer him to you as well. Um, so they are having artists, imagine, um, but it sounds like they have an FHA loan. Is it possible from an FHA loan to convey? You're cutting out. I can. I, I only caught bits and pieces of uh, that. I'm sorry. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. So I'm my brother who is house hunting and he's difficult time trying to get a house. Uh, if you had maybe if it's a separate conversation, I'm happy to refer him to you. But just didn't know if you had any advice. They have an FHA loan, and it sounds like for what he the realtor is telling him is a lot of his issues is that they don't have the conventional loan. So just kind of points those wonders that do you have any advice for those who are seeking a house now who are having trouble for and is it too and is it possible to convert from a FHA loan to a conventional loan? So that's kind of twofold. So if they're if they are trying to purchase a home, depending upon where their scores are, the loan programs are pretty much across the board open for kind of your circumstance. So um, let's just say that they don't have any money down um, or they have very little down. They would probably want to go FHA because FHA offers um, anywhere to 3% or three and a half to 4% down um, and your fees are generally lower. And then, you know, the FHA can go all the way down to a, a 5.8 or I'm sorry, a 6.20. I, they go all the way down to 5.80. And that, I always kind of catch myself on this, but there's different caveats for percentages down when you get down into the 5.80 range. So 6.20 to 6.40 is more of a sweet spot for FHA. 660 to 680 is going to be your sweet spot and then higher for your conventional loans. So it really kind of depends on their situation. Um, conventional might also require you to have more money down as well. So you kind of have to, we have to weigh their situation to kind of decide what's best for them. Um, there was one other thing though that you said that I, I want to just make sure that I'm understanding correctly. Were you asking also about the loan that they're in now and if that can be changed? So, yes, but I also am hearing what you said. I may have to just, I mean, because of course I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I, the biggest issue, and I'm sure you've seen the articles, is that they are getting beat out of every house they're trying to get. And, and what the realtor is telling them is that is because they have an FHA loan. Now, he tells me his core is 660. I don't, I think the mortgage company is shady personally, but he, you know, he's, he doesn't want, of course, all the inquiries and whatnot. So, uh, so, but yeah, so it really, I really, I think the, the better question for anybody else really, because his is might be specific and I'll absolutely have him contact you is did you have any advice for those who are seeking to buy a house in this crazy market that we're in now in, in terms of just kind of, because people are paying like 50,000 over the asking price. So I didn't know if there was any reasonable <laughs> recommendations that you might have. I'll tell you what, it's a scary market out there, you guys. Um, and part of, part of my biggest problem is that back in 2009, I was doing um, real estate closings for a title company and we were doing closings just boom, 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 right at one right after the next, probably 45 to 90 a month we were, we were closing and people were getting the, the first and second mortgages. They were getting a higher second mortgage. And then what happened at the end is that their homes didn't appraise high enough and so, of course, all these homes went to foreclosure. My biggest concern for where we're at right now is that the same thing is going to happen. And all these homes that people are paying 50 and 60 and $70,000 over asking price is what's going to happen in two or three years when they either try to sell or refinance. Are they going to be able to do that? So I caution everybody to kind of think through that process as you go. Um, I will tell you that I had another lender call me this week and say, hey, things have changed. I got to get this client out of an FHA loan. They got to be a 660 to a 680 because they're not accepting an FHA contract on this home, which is crazy to me. But right now we're in a market where the seller wants to get what they want. Um, they want a bidding war and a conventional loan is generally less messy than an FHA loan. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's nothing that you can do to change that. So the most important thing I would say for him would be to make sure that his scores are high enough. If his, if for any reason his credit card balances are too high, I would pay those down to like 10%. That's gonna help his, his scores increase a little bit, 
which might help kick him into that 660 to 680 marker to where a conventional loan would be more feasible for him to do. And, and definitely, Yolanda, have him reach out to me. Um, I'll go ahead and put my phone number in the chat box, but have him reach out to me so we can just review his report and maybe there's something that he could tweak to get his scores to raise just a little bit to, to make sure that he fits into that conventional caveat. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. Heather, I've got a few other questions. Uh, one, is, one of them is how often should you pull your credit report? Is there value in choosing or pulling from all three services? Um, and the other question is in regards to um, being an executor. So let's say that you are the executor for a deceased person. Are you required to pay back any balances, um, pay any outstanding loan balances that are left behind? You as the executor are not actually on the loan. Okay, so um, I have to I have to kind of be careful. I can't dance on a legal line here, but I can tell you that any time that um, there is a property that um, is is potentially worth something, let's just say even two hundred thousand dollars, and there is a loan on it for a hundred thousand dollars, and that person is deceased. Um, the executor of the will typically will have to push for a sale or possibly if someone, if the executor wants to keep the home, typically what's going to have to happen is it will have to be refinanced out of their name. Now, until that happens, you could feasibly go in and make those payments. If you wanted to live in the property or something of that nature, you could feasibly go in and make those payments to make sure that they stayed on time and then possibly refinance it out of that name into your name. There are probate issues. So you're kind of dancing on a legal line with that question, um, simply for the fact that until you kind of know what the tax repercussions are that's held in that property. So if there's a lot of, um, if there's a lot of equity or there's a lot of asset to the property, you have to be kind of careful with that too, because sometimes that falls under probate court as well. So definitely find a good probate attorney that can kind of walk you through that because I know only so much when it comes to real estate law, um, but I can't, I can't really delve into that just because I'm not a, an, an attorney. So definitely reach out to somebody in, in the probate um, attorney sector because they'll be able to walk you through that instantly. Great. And then um, um, question two on that same kind of line about being the executor for a deceased person. Um, is it kind of the same thoughts about the credit card balances? So that's going to be a little bit different. You don't typically have to pay those back because that customer or that, that person is now deceased. So their credit report, unless you are a joint owner of that credit card, you probably don't need to worry about that. That will be included in the estate. So the reason why we, we don't really go into much detail on that is because let's just say they owe $10,000 in credit cards. They have a home that's worth 200, but they owe 100. Um, what the, the executor of that estate or, and or possibly even the probate judge might require is that the home gets sold so that those debts can be paid. So if you are, if you're the executor of an estate, I would recommend just doing the mortgage payments versus the credit card payments. Um, like I said, unless you're a joint owner and it's going to destroy your credit to let it go, that's where you kind of have to just watch what you're doing. Um, that's the best advice I can give just simply, again, because I don't want to teeter on that line of giving out legal advice. Okay, thank you. And then I've got another question for you in the chat. Um, what would be a better loan option for a first-time buyer? Um, first home buyer, obviously, FHA loan is a great loan. Um, like we just talked about, it being kind of one of those things that is really going to kind of depend on the market um, and whether or not they will accept an FHA contract. Um, FHA is one of the better ones. It does go down to 580. And so if you've got some credit issues, sometimes there are some, some caveats that will help you. Um, I will also tell you that it's great to keep my information at hand because there are lenders that do special programs through the neighborhoods um, that are basically 
they're designated for certain areas to kind of help that area rebuild, uh, rejuvenate the area. Um, right now, Commerce Bank has a great program that goes all the way down to 580. And they are, I mean, they really don't, I'm not going to say they don't scrutinize your credit report, but they really have got some good caveats to make it affordable for you to get into a home right now. Um, so, but you have to be within a certain area. Um, there are, like I said, some caveats to that, but um, that's a great loan program. Conventional loans are good too. If you've got some money down or maybe it's your second time buying, that's a good loan program to do. On the first time home buyer, um, you know, if you're doing FHA and you have a 640, you can couple that with MHDC, which gives you some down payment assistance funds. So that's always an option too. That's a good one. Um, I, you know, it depends on their credit score, how much money they have in savings. A lot of things kind of ride on, on those qualifying factors too. So every situation is just a little bit different. Um, you know, kind of just give us a call and we'll help you walk through that, that scenario together. Awesome. Well, there are no more questions in the chat. I'll open it up to the group. Does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask? Um, I do. Uh, good evening, everyone. Lachey Sanders. Heather, first off, thank you so much for amazing information. Very, very, very informative. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm a recent college grad, but I did graduate um, from Hampton University in 2016. Uh, bachelor's and in 2017 with my master's but in between then um, I did acquire kind of like my big girl credit card if you will when I was in college I kind of did what you did uh, what you mentioned in your presentation was I had a, a, a small credit card um, that had literally a $600 credit limit I was in college I used it for little things such as gas to pay it off so my credit would build um, by the time I graduated now that I have my big girl credit card I have an extended credit line, if you will. Um, and I got happy. I'm going to admit, awesome. I, got, I got happy. I said, oh my goodness, I can spend this much money as an adult. Wow. <laughs> you got to pay it back. But right. yeah. So, so my question is, I, I think I've done a, a fairly good job with um, paying back. I do have a really good credit score um, okay. based on the ranges, but I guess I would like to exceed what I have now. So my question with all of that being the caveat to this is I've heard that, let's say your credit card payment is due on the 15th and you owe a minimum of $100 every payment. If you pay $50 on the 5th and then you pay $50 on the 14th, that increases your credit score or that goes towards building your credit score. Is that true? And if so, are there other ways to build your credit score? If not, what do you recommend? Um, first of all, congratulations on, on everything. That's awesome. Um, there's nothing better than getting a credit card with a high limit because even though we may not use it, it's just great to have it. As we build our credit, you're going to see that you're going to get more and more offers it's okay to have two or three with a decent credit line because as you increase those lines, your scores are gonna to increase too. So the payments are an important thing. The best thing to do is to find out when your credit card reports to the bureaus and make sure that you make your payments prior to that happening and you're leaving a balance. So if they report on the 15th, you would wanna make sure that you, if you wanna set up two different payments, you can just make sure that you're doing that prior to them actually reporting it to the bureaus, okay? That's where you're gonna get your number, your first boost. The second boost is gonna come in when they see that you've left a balance. Cause as I talked about, if you are paying it, if you go zero last month and it's zero this month, there's no reason for them to update. So we wanna leave a small balance so that they have to report something. Again, they don't do their job most of the time. So we want to force them into doing that. So if you leave a small little balance, if instead of paying 50 and 50, you pay 50 and maybe 48, you're going to see a bigger jump in your scores than what you would if you paid 50 and 50. So credit is, is like a chess game. And that's, it's not why they named the company chess, but um, it really is a chess game. And it's one of those things where once you kind of figure out how the algorithm works, you can start to manipulate the system. I don't like to teach that to people, but 
it is possible to really kind of start to use your credit cards to really make your scores increase. And then if you know that you're going to have your credit pulled by either a car dealership or a mortgage company, you know that, hey, I'm going to get the best out of it when they pull it because they updated on the 15th. So those are the, the different things that you can look out for with the credit cards that will help you kind of excel your credit score and make it boost as well. The other thing is to have the bits and pieces that we kind of talked about. So you have your installment loan and you have your credit card. Those are going to be the, the two things that are going to help you build. But remember, installments are only for 10% of your score. So the credit cards, you having two or three of those is really going to help you boost up quicker. The other thing, if you've had your credit card for more than six months and you haven't gotten an increase, go ahead and ask for one. It's going to help your scores increase as well. You might see a little drop initially, but what that's going to do is just help kind of increase and you're going to level up each time. Each time you're going to get a little bit more, which is going to increase your scores. It's also going to increase your offers. So just make sure that as you get them, that you know, you're keeping it at a reasonable number, two to three cards, um, and that you're keeping those balances low you're gonna get a great score out of it. Um, and like I said, you can kind of manipulate the system to when you need it to, to really kind of boost you. Um, and thank you so much. And then my piggyback question off of that is you talked a lot about um, companies or car dealerships that tend to pull your credit prior to giving you what your, the service you're asking for. Um, retail stores, the ones that say, hey, do you wanna sign up for our credit card? Are those in-store credit cards pulling your credit as well, or is that just an internal thing with that company? They're definitely pulling your credit as well. So you're going to see that inquiry from Gap or wherever. Um, crazy story, but my son going off to college, you know, he thought he was uh, he he was one of the kids that fell into where they used to have like the actual credit card stands setting up when they when they went for their. Um, their initiate or not initiation day, but when they when they first went in, they they see all these things and they're like, oh, well, let me get this credit card, let me get this, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get that. Destroyed his credit because he literally got three or four and then let him go. Those department store cards are gonna weigh just as heavy as what a Capital One or yeah, not just as heavy, but almost as heavy as what a Capital One or Discover is gonna do as well. You're gonna see the inquiry, you're gonna get hit with the same point decrease as what you would for any other inquiry. Um, as far as dealerships go, when you really kind of start looking at the dealerships, depending upon where your scores are at, you know, if you can stay away from the buy here, pay here, you're gonna be better off when it comes to your credit because typically they're gonna run you four, five, six, seven times just to try to get you approved with one of the places that they already knew, you know, they, they could probably get you approved for, but they run you through several. If you go to like, um, like I don't know, a Dodge dealership or some, something that is where you can get different types of financing and you go in with your power of your credit report and you say, hey, I know that my credit report's a 650 or 660. What they're gonna do is they're gonna take that information and say, hey, you might approve for this company. So we'll only run you here instead of running your credit report, you know, five, six, seven, eight, 10 times sometimes. Awesome. Well, thank you all for all of those questions. We're going to wrap up our question and answer portion now. For any additional questions that you have, Heather has graciously shared her phone number um, and you can contact her directly moving forward. I'm going to turn this back over to Laura for our results of the test your knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather, again, for sharing with us your wealth of, of knowledge. So Audience, we're going to see how well you are paying attention. Um, and as um, Heather gave her presentation, I think she touched on each of the questions that were presented at the beginning of the presentation. So how well were you paying attention? Question number one, how long does it take, how long does it take bad debt to be removed from your credit report? Miss G, years. seven years. Who said? Who I said seven, seven or ten? Miss G. Okay, it is seven years. Um, now, there's a caveat to this. There's a caveat to everything when we start talking about credit. Um, seven years is the statute of limitations. Okay, so if you have a credit card that you took out today, 
and you decided not to pay it and went charge off status. Um, and let's just say that they got a judgment too. So you let it go to charge off status and now it's in collections. Um, they got a judgment as well. The statute of limitations will go by the judgment. So you have seven years from the statute of limitation or seven years from when the judgment was filed. It'll stay on your credit report. They can try to collect it for up to 10 years. It doesn't mean that it stays on your report, but by law in Missouri, um, if you sign a contract, so it's any kind of a contractual deal, if it's a credit card, card note, whatever, it's a 10 year collection period from the date of default. So basically if you, you know, they'll still call you for the next three years, but seven years it's required by law to be removed as per the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Very good, thank you. Number two, is bad credit removed once the debt is paid off? Yes or no? no? Nope. Nope. You're right. All so, right. That's another reason why you, you could use our company. Um, there are ways to get the old debt removed. Um, I'll just touch on one more thing that we didn't really talk about. I'm going to tell you guys, I have about 10 different presentations that I can do for you when it comes to credit. Um, and part of it is kind of just the inaccuracies that credit reporting agencies don't necessarily stop creditors from doing. So if you have a charged off credit card or something like that, that's bad debt and you settled it, but let's just say they updated your trade line incorrectly. That means that you have a right as part of the Fair Credit Reporting Act to dispute that information and say, hey, this is wrong. You should have reported it this way. That's also a way that sometimes it can get removed. So the, the option is there to try to work that out, to try to get it removed. It doesn't automatically fall off though, just to kind of be clear there. Thank you. Number three, what is a good percentage to keep your credit card balances under? 10, 30, 30 50, or 75? 30%. Yep, 30% is, is the deal breaker. Once you hit 31%, you're automatically going to drop that 25 to 30% of your scores. 10% um, is actually the perfect score to be under. I'm sorry, 10% is the actual balance to be under. The reason is it's going to pick up that you've got activity and that you're using that card correctly and you're keeping a low balance. So you're actually considered a very good borrower because you're actually not maxing out that credit. So you have to kind of look at it like this. When someone's looking at your credit report, they're gonna look at all of your balances. If you're maxed out, you look like a maxed out borrower. So we wanna make sure that those are all paid under, then your scores are gonna reflect higher. You guys are doing a great job. Um, can you buy a house with a 650 credit score? And the resounding answer is- Yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Now, our last question, what is the FICA credit score range from 300 to 850, from 500 to 1,000, from 100 to 500? Hmm. Well, I say 500 to 1,000. I don't know. I have 300 to 850. 300 to 850. Is that the right one, 300 to 850? I didn't know that one. Yes, it's 300 to 850. And I will just tell you, I've been doing credit for 10 or for 12 years. I've never seen an 850. Um, I have been lucky to see a 725. That was the highest that mm -hmm. I've ever seen. So if you have a 700, please don't be discouraged because you are way up above average. Um, and that's a great score. So even though the scoring models say that it's good, good to be at like the 650 to 660 it's actually pretty darn good so don't beat yourself up if you're in that 660 to 680 range most people are not going to see 850 in their lifetime but maybe one of you guys will surprise me maybe one of you guys have an 850 and if you do i want to use you as an example <laughs> for sure heather i have a, a quick quick question um, sure. now that we met, uh, talked about credit score fica i have a credit card that gives me my FICA score on a monthly basis or every month. Is that accurate or is that something that I can really take to the bank? It's, it's not 100% accurate. It's gonna be a version of FICO. So there's several different versions of FICO. Um, can I ask what card it is? Is it credit-wise credit that you're getting? Discover. Oh, Discover, okay. Mm -hmm. 
It's probably pretty close. Um, okay. I would say within five to 15 points, it's probably a good, um, you know, a good range. The fight, the true FICO that you're going to pull when you get from a lender is going to be different than pretty much anything else you're going to see online. Just to kind of give you an example, like we had somebody that was a 640 and was ready to purchase a home, but when the car dealership pulled her, she didn't get approved because her scores weren't high enough because it pulled different intricate pieces of her credit. So anytime that you're looking at different types of reports, your credit card reports are going to show you what your credit cards look like and maybe a few other factors, but a majority of that score is going to be driven off of your credit cards and usage, how you've paid them back. Whereas if, you know, like we talked about, the FICO is going to weigh all of them. So we know that it's going to take an average of everything and kind of combine it together. Whereas those different types of reports are going to pull kind of like accounts, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like even your dealerships are going to look at what you've done on other installment loans, because that's the type of loan that they're going to give you. So gotcha. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question. Uh, this is Phyllis Whiteside. If you are a small business owner and you, is there a difference between business credit and your personal credit? Will the business credit help your personal, your personal help your business credit? So your, your personal helps your business. So um, what I suggest you do is um, because banks don't necessarily like business credit. Now, um, I'm going to dance a fine line here again. Um, if you are applying for credit cards, um, you can do it in the business name. They're going to want to see your credit scores high. If you go into, let's just say, Commerce Bank and you want to do a business loan or whatever bank, I, it doesn't really matter, but you want to do a business loan. And it's a kind of a small town, hometown bank, um, you know, Arvest, those types of banks. Most of the time, they're not going to look at your business score. They're going to look at your personal score and make sure that you can pay it back. So if you walk into Arvest Bank with a 640 and you say, hey, I want to do a business loan for my catering business and I need $100,000 and you walk in with a 640, they're probably going to deny you. The reason is, is because your scores are not high enough to personally guarantee that loan. They want to see your scores anywhere from a 670 to a 700 to really kind of be in that range of being able to basically co-sign for your own business. So business credit is super important. Um, as you kind of navigate through that, you're probably going to have credit cards and stuff like that that you're going to want to put in the business name that's going to help you build your scores. Business credit goes from zero to 100. So there, it's not like your normal score, scoring model. And it's really kind of hard to, to build those scores quickly. Um, you have to do a lot of, the companies have to do a lot of reporting. And a lot of times with business accounts, it's hard to get them to do that. You have to actually contact Duns and Bradstreet and have them, your Duns number, have them actually contact those creditors and have them report the information. They call one time if they miss that, if they, you miss that phone call, they don't call back again. So it's kind of one of those things that's hard to get your business score to build. But I do recommend to a lot of my clients is that we build your, your personal score as high as we can, get your buying power up. And then when you go in to get your loan, getting approved shouldn't be an issue because basically your, your personal scores are high enough to personally guarantee that loan. Now, if you own a business and you wanna buy a home, be careful maxing yourself out on your business credit. Remember that anything that's attached to your social security number factors into your DTI. If your DTI is too high, you can't get approved for a home loan. So if, you are, if you're trying to build your business and you wanna buy a home, those are things that you definitely wanna to talk to a professional about because you have to do things in increments. You can't just do it all at one time. You're gonna put yourself in a position to where you're not gonna be able to do maybe purchase that home or car or whatever because of your maxed out business. So just be super careful with that. Contact me. I can help kind of walk you through that process um, and, and just help make sure that you don't put yourself in a situation that maybe you can't um, get a loan. Um, I just saw one come across. This is what is a general DTI for a home loan? 
So this is one of those things that um, can go anywhere from 32% all the way up to 48%. Some might even go a little bit higher. Those FHA loans, are, um, sometimes there's some wiggle room in there to go a little bit higher, but there's so many different caveats. Your lender is going to have to be the one that kind of tells you where your debt to income is and what kind of loan they can give you based off of that. Um, normal, you know, just a normal situation is usually about 43% when we talk about an FHA loan, 36% um, when we're talking about a conventional loan. So basically your, your debt to income can't be any higher than 36% or 43% or 48%. So every lender is going to kind of walk you through those things. And those are things too, that we can also help with. We can put you with a lender who will actually walk you through those details. All right. Well, thank you all so much for all of your questions and for participating in your test, the not your knowledge. It has been my honor and privilege to be your moderator for our workshop this evening. Um, I am going to turn it over now to Phyllis to give our thank you and our final wrap up. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Phyllis Whiteside and I, along with uh, Lauren Patton, we are co-chairs of this committee. This is the part that I heard is such has been an awesome presentation. And Heather, I would like to thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us. And hopefully we're looking forward to having some more um, credit repair or credit literacy workshops in the future. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're most welcome. Awesome. Well, that concludes our workshop for this evening. Thank you all so much again for joining and have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Thank guys. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.